Good evening. This is DeForestories Jr. We're here live, 8 p.m. on the evening of January the 25th, 2015. And I've been listening to one of my old favorites, For the Love of Money by the OJs. Now, this song was recorded years ago. But if you'll notice, our purpose for gathering tonight affirms the fact that this song is as relevant and inspiring today as it was back in the day. So welcome. Welcome to our first D-Free experience on a Sunday night. Uh, our 2015 journey to financial freedom. I hope you've seen the welcome screen. If you've not seen the welcome screen, I'll show it back to you in a few minutes. But I'm being assisted by one of our online geniuses, Sanaya Williams. And tonight, our objective is to welcome you to D-Free. We started D-Free in 2005 at our church in New Jersey. And since that time, hundreds of people have learned how to uh, pay as they go, avoid credit card and consumer debt, to pay their bills on time, um, avoiding late fees and penalties, and live within their means, live according to a spending plan. The D stands for debt delinquencies and deficits. That's what we want to be free from. But it also stands for deposits, dividends, and deeds. Being able to make deposits in our own accounts, to own real estate, other assets that require deeds that put our names on them, and of course, earn dividends from investments. This has been a liberating 10 years for me, and it's not only based on what I learned um, from reading books and from watching other people's lives, but most of what you'll hear me talk about in the next uh, few months is based on what I experienced myself. I was drowning in debt for 15 years. For 15 years, I was paying last month's bills with next week's check. For 15 years, I was dressed up on the outside but messed up on the inside. For 15 years, from the time I was 18 years old till the time I was 33 years old, I was living above my means and doing all of the crazy things that I describe in my book. I decided that I had to change my life. I'll give you some sense of what happened to cause me to change. And uh, as a result of that change, was able to get married, first of all, and then to live a debt-free life. Uh, upon becoming pastor of First Baptist Church where I serve today, I, I was able to use my lessons, the lessons I learned from the Bible, the lessons I learned from experience, the lessons I learned from listening to people on the radio, reading books, and uh, put all of that together into a campaign to help the members of First Baptist Church. And so if you're a member of First Baptist Church, welcome to your D3 movement. If you are someplace else in the country, I am uh, thrilled that we have this chance to do precisely what we're doing tonight in the privacy of our homes without having to share our business with other people and using technology to gain the content that God has given us. I have an outline I want to share with you. Uh, you should know that the content of our time together tonight and every month throughout this year comes uh, first from the book that we wrote, D3, Breaking Free from Financial Slavery. There it is right there, uh, D3, Breaking Free from Financial Slavery. The book is available uh, through Amazon.com, through myd3.org. There is a link to Amazon. You can get this book. It's uh, You can download it 
it, it doesn't cost more than ten dollars I'm sure um, the workbook which is what we're going to use for our instruction every month we've got 12 months in the year we've got 12 steps in our workbook and therefore 12 chapters our workbook is uh, the D free lifestyle there it is say yes to no debt 12 steps to financial freedom and so if you have a workbook you can pull your workbook out we'll be going through sections of the workbook there's too much to do in each chapter of the workbook in one night but I'm going to hit some of the highlights and I'm going to ask you to interact with me as we make this an interactive experience I don't want to talk for an hour not that I can't talk for an hour but I'd rather uh, have feedback from you and so if there's a chat box available you can send email if you have somebody's text number uh, cell number you can text them but we want we want you to gear up now be prepared for the exchange of answers and ideas I'll be asking questions that I'm hoping someone can answer we'll be offering prizes throughout the year to people that answer questions right and we hope to make this a, a dialogue not a monologue and more importantly an empowering experience that we can then share with other people before we get started let me uh, show you the uh, the uh, Welcome once again for those who came in late. I want to make sure that you see what everybody saw while we were listening to the OJs, and then we're going to begin with a word of prayer. This uh, is the path to financial freedom. I'm welcoming you to our monthly interactive webinar series. Uh, each monthly session will be from a chapter in that workbook that I showed you, D Free Lifestyle. If you have a copy, you should have it available. If you don't have a copy, you can purchase it online. You can actually download a copy. The downloadable copy is, is a bit weird because the workbook is such that you'd like to write things down and you can't write things down on a tablet or phone. But if you want to expedite the process, I have the workbook on my iPad and I also have the workbook in my hand. And so I use the workbook to read. There are nice stories in the workbook. There are statistics in the workbook, there are different challenges and affirmations in the workbook, certainly there are scriptures that we want to memorize in the workbook, and there are prayers, one of which we're going to pray tonight in the workbook. And so there's no harm in having an electronic version of the workbook, but the most useful version of the workbook is the paper version, and if you have trouble finding the paper version, you just shoot us an email through the website, and what you'll be able to do is to have us send you a workbook through the mail. So tonight, we're going to be talking about the D-Free Lifestyle uh, Level 1. When we talk about a D-Free Lifestyle, what we're really talking about is um, four levels of growth. And of course, we'll start with Level 1. Level 1 is get started. You can't imagine how many people I encounter as I move around the country who say to me, uh, sorry, I would love to invest in real estate. I would love to buy stocks. I would love to get out of debt. I just don't where to know where to start. So tonight we're going to be um, microscopic in our description of how to get started, how to go from where you are on whatever level you find yourself to, to where you'd like to be in the foreseeable future. Uh, that is exactly what we're doing tonight. It's what we call level one in the workbook. If you have a workbook, uh, sh shoot us I'm getting a uh, a chat from Gina Gibson. Hello, Gina. Good evening. Uh, so she's found a way to interrupt the discourse by sending some kind of chat, and I'm sure you will too. We're going to uh, share now the uh, PowerPoint once again so that you can see where we're headed. So level one is get started, and, and we're going to start with the theme, uh, admit the problem. So what I'd like everyone to do right now is to uh, pray this prayer with me. Don't close your eyes because I want you to read it. And we're, we're going to ask you to read the words after I read the words and at the end we will say amen together. And so are you ready? Let us pray. Dear God, now you say dear God, Dear God, 
I'm beginning a journey toward financial freedom. I pray that you will give me the strength to see myself, to help myself, and to trust your instructions. Thank you for what is about to happen in my life. Amen. Now in the workbook, after we pray, we, we ask everyone to construct a response to their prayers. And my response as I was climbing out of debt was to say, once I communicate and admit to myself that I have a financial problem, then I'm more open to finding out the reasons and solutions to the problem. Now, before we go any further, on the YouTube page that belongs to DFree, it's, it's youtube.com forward slash mydfree. There's a playlist called testimonials, and those testimonials include a testimony from Letitia Thomas. Because I have so much to cover tonight, and because I've got some introductory work to do in addition to the content, I'm not going to play Letitia's testimony. But on the deep free page, there's a link to YouTube. You can go straight to YouTube. But Letitia has a approximately 45 second testimony about what happened in her life when she read the deep free book. She highly recommends that you not only read the book, but you take action. And that's a part of what happens when you get started. You have to take specific actions. You can't just take notes. You have to take action. And some of the actions we're going to recommend tonight flow from the content at the beginning of our workbook. So Letitia Thomas, who is in Chicago, gave us this testimony. And I'd love for you to go to YouTube. Don't go right now, but go to YouTube after our session's over tonight and listen to Letitia's testimony. Now, if you're ready, pull out your workbook. And if you don't have your workbook with you, then here is what we're going to ask you to do. And that is to identify three financial goals for 2015. Three financial goals for 2015. Now, don't say that by the end of 2015, you, you want to own the Los Angeles Lakers. That's not going to happen unless you are currently in negotiations to buy the Los Angeles Lakers. But what is it? you'd like to be able to say you accomplished this year. The fact of the matter is that in many of our churches, including ours, where we teach D3, we, we do it within the context of a 12-week course. I don't know anybody who was in serious debt that got out of debt in 12 weeks. It takes 12 weeks to really develop our perspective and our strategy about debt the average person takes three to five years to really get out of debt. I decided to get out of debt in year 13 of my credit card addiction, and it took me two years to climb out of the debt that I had accumulated in 13 years, and so I described myself as having this 15-year journey. But what would, what would December 31st look like if you were to accomplish your financial goals? Take a minute, think about it. Write it down. Get a small piece of paper and write it down. And what I'd like you to do is to just say a short prayer and commit those three goals to God. Perhaps you want to pay off a student loan in 2015. Perhaps you want to pay off two credit cards by the end of 2015. But the key to getting started, the key to financial freedom, the key to developing even a small level of wealth is, is to identify your goals. I heard a man say one time, if, if you don't know where you're headed, then anywhere you land will be okay. So what are your goals for 2015? It may be to donate more money to the church. It, it, may be to, it may be to stop lending money to your cousin. But identify three concrete, specific goals. Write them down. People who have written goals are much more successful than people who don't have written goals. And when you write down those goals, just pause for a second. and Think about those goals. You may have four goals. 
you may have five goals. I would urge you, however, to limit the number of goals that you write down because if you have too many goals, you set yourself up for failure. It's better to have two or three concrete goals that are bite-sized that you can accomplish and really get it done than it is to have 10 or 12 goals and you frustrate yourself and then halfway to 2015's end, you're so frustrated you give up because you'll never get there. I'd rather see you have goals that are too small than goals that are too large. If you have an uh, itsy, itsy bitsy teeny weeny goal, if you have a very small goal, you may get there by Easter. But the good thing about a small goal that's accomplished by Easter is that you can then replace it with another goal. And so if you have to choose between goals too big and goals very small, choose a small goal. Small goals are much better than big goals that cannot be achieved realistically by the end of 2015. It's now January the 25th. We're already four weeks into the new year. And we're starting now knowing that some people have already given up on their financial goals or their New Year's resolutions for 2015. I'm here to say that it is completely possible to reach goals in 2015, even if it doesn't appear that you're on your way to those goals. But what I want you to do is write them down. Write down the two or three or four goals that you have decided you're going to accomplish by the end of this year. If you have a workbook, write them down in your workbook. If you don't, write them down on the back of an envelope. Don't write them on your palm, but write them down on something that you'll be able to look at tomorrow. Let's see what's next in our first night of our journey towards financial freedom. The section of the workbook this is on page nine that I really want to launch our discussion tonight has to do with uncovering chains. You'll notice that the name of my book is Breaking Free from Financial Slavery. I have to tell you that when I was drowning in debt, I really didn't feel bad about it. I mean, everybody I knew was in debt. Um, it was a lifestyle that didn't embarrass me. All the adults that I knew were in debt. And so I felt fine paying my bills late. I was a little embarrassed when I would go to restaurants, give the waitress my credit card, and, and hope that it didn't come back declined. But for the most part, I, I, I didn't feel unhappy at all. Now, it was frustrating being a civil rights leader back in those days. It was frustrating being the pastor of a church and not having money. It was, it was embarrassing, actually, being the pastor of a church, and I couldn't even tithe or give to my own church. But, but the truth of the matter is, uh, it didn't really smack me in my face that my lifestyle was as bad as it was until I read this verse in Proverbs 22.7. I was a teenager at the peak of the civil rights movement, and not only were, were civil rights uh, part of our passion, but growing up in the North, I was also influenced by Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism meaning black people all over the world should unite and feel some kinship with each other. And I was passionate ab about black pride and, and Afri African-American culture. And, and so, as you can imagine, I, I was completely offended by the idea of slavery. I was outraged that my ancestors had been dragged from Africa, had, had, had survived the Middle Passage. On my grandfather's side, they were dropped off in the Caribbean. On my grandmother's side, they came to Virginia, and that African Americans had the history that they had. I spoke to Alex Haley when I was a student at Rutgers as he was crisscrossing the country, developing the content of his epic work, Roots. And I was determined for the rest of my life to help African Americans especially overcome the effects of slavery as it was practiced in North America. But I never associated the way I handled money to the idea of slavery. For me, slavery was limited to what Caucasians had done to African Americans in North America and throughout the Caribbean. But then the Bible, which is 
my guide now for living, the Bible which is the foundation for Christian thought, the Bible which really frames Judeo-Christian values. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 7, that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Can you imagine how embarrassed I was, how crazy I felt? Here I was, a grown man. I, I was a preacher of the gospel. I was a pastor of a small church, the very church that I grew up in. I have been preaching against racism. I have been protesting against injustice. I was fighting not, not just slavery, but I was fighting the effects, the long-term effects of slavery. You can't hold people in slavery for as long as black were held in slavery and, and not know that there are going to be effects even after they are liberated. And so long after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, there were effects of slavery, educational effects, family effects, economic effects. And so I dedicated my life to working on the effects of slavery. I worked for a national civil rights organization called Operation Push, and I felt good about my life every day of my life. The day Martin Luther King was killed, I dedicated my life to doing something to help someone the way Dr. King helped us. But it wasn't until I was very grown, when I say very grown, I mean very, very grown. And it wasn't until I had trouble with the Internal Revenue Service, service. It wasn't until I had credit cards taken from me because I hadn't paid my bills. It wasn't until I was driving a car that was so expensive that it took 50% of my salary. It wasn't until then that reading this verse changed my life. That the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Can you imagine how embarrassing it was for a young African-American who aspired to be a leader of his people to discover that while he protested and resented slavery, that he himself had signed up voluntarily for slavery? Because the Bible says that the borrower, the credit card user, the high interest rate, auto loan borrower, the payday loan subscriber, that, that we were slaves to the lender. Actually, I ignored this verse for years, just ignored it. I just didn't know it was there. But once, once I thought about it, and, and once I realized what the Bible was saying, I was absolutely offended. Now, in the workbook, what I'm asking you to do is to answer the question, why do you think the Bible says that? The Proverbs are attributed to Solomon. Solomon is described as the wisest person who ever lived. And what, what I discovered was that uh, the Bible probably said that because the fact is a slave's life and a slave's work benefits the slave master and not the slave. When black people were in slavery, they worked. They did the work and the slave master made the money. When I was drowning in debt, I did the work, but I was paying such high prices for credit that the creditors made the money. And so rather than saving money in my 20s for retirement, rather than using money to buy insurance, ra rather than investing money for my, for my future, I was spending as much as I could through credit cards and just the interest that I paid on those credit cards meant that more of my work benefited other people, the creditors, than benefited me, the borrower. Why do you think Solomon used those words that the borrower is slave to the lender? Think about it. Just pause and reflect on that for a few minutes. Think about how much money you owe and what kind of options you have in light of the fact that you owe that kind of money. What happens if you don't make two car payments? I think what happens is you discover it's not really your car. Whoever is in charge of the relationship is the ruler of that relationship. And when you look at it on a national scale, what you discover is that our country owes other countries, certain countries, so much money 
we can't even criticize them when we object to the way they treat certain people. The borrower is slave to the lender. The first time Africans were in slavery, we were snatched from our homes, our communities, our villages in Africa, and we were dragged across the Middle Passage and worked without pay. The second time we found ourselves in slavery, we signed on the dotted line, took our credit card, collected our friends, went out and celebrated. When I realized that I, as a pastor and a civil rights leader, had voluntarily signed up for slavery, that's when I knew my life had to change. Think about it. Why do you think, Solomon said, the borrower is slave to the lender? Be right back. If you joined us late, this is DeForest Sores. This is step one, a 12-step journey to financial freedom. We prayed our prayer. We welcomed everyone to our experience. I'm using uh, what you see on the screen as an excerpt from the workbook called D Free Lifestyle, 12 Steps to Financial Freedom. Even if you don't have the book or the workbook, what we're going to cover tonight will help you as you think in terms of beginning the process of rising out of the condition you're in financially and, and, and going to a higher level that we call financial freedom. Uncovering the chains simply means identifying the fact that if we're honest with ourselves, we really have put ourselves in a bind if we're living the way I used to live. Not, a, not everybody's in debt. Not everybody's in debt for the same reason. We'll get into that probably next time. But the proposition is this. When Prudential Insurance Company asked African Americans about their financial goals, four out of five said their number one priority was to get out of debt. The reality is, my brothers and sisters, the reality is that we can't be completely free until we get out of debt. You can't own real estate if you have too much debt. You can't have peace of mind if you, if you are drowning in debt. You, you will miss more days from work because of the drama caused by debt. What I'm telling you is that you and I have to focus on the number one challenge being debt. Now there are other challenges and whatever those challenges are and however we got into debt, the first step towards financial freedom is to admit that we have the challenge. For some people, the challenge came about as a re result of a divorce. For some people, the challenge came about as a result of uh, unemployment. For some people, the challenge came about as the consequence of bad health and sickness that the insurance company wouldn't cover. Some people just took out too many student loans. They thought that if they got a degree from college, that they'd be able to pay back all of this money and they piled up all of this debt. But what, whatever, whatever the reason is, what, what I discovered was the way to get out of debt was first to understand that debt is slavery. And my passion for fighting slavery became equal to my passion for fighting debt. And as a result, I now am on a mission to help people out of debt the same way I was on a mission to help people deal with discrimination, racism, and slavery. So I want you to reflect on this. This is, this is page 10 in the workbook. This is what we would do if we were in class uh, at First Baptist or at uh, Ivy Baptist in Virginia or at Emmanuel Baptist in Indianapolis. If we were in your church, in your local community, if we were with you at your sorority meeting with the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, if we were with you in Washington with the Collective Empowerment Group, wherever there are people having D-free sessions or D-free classes, we would take a few minutes and ask you to talk to each other about why Solomon said what he said and whether or not his words are true in your life tonight. Now, the other thing we would do if we were in class or if we had more time tonight is we would now break to let you watch an eight-minute video that summer.
summarizes this entire first step. I did a video series called uh, D Free to Be Free, and it was a part of a project that we did with Tracy Edmonds, Bob Johnson, and All Right TV. This video resides on our YouTube page. You can go to youtube.com uh, forward slash D Free, and there's another playlist called D Free to Be Free TV program. And episode number one summarizes what's in the first chapter of the book. It summarizes what's in the first chapter of the workbook. And what we want you to do is to uh, watch that video. Don't watch it now, but we'll be done shortly. And when we're done, uh, make sure you watch these two videos. First, watch the video with the testimony. And, and secondly, watch the video with uh, myself talking about don't be broke and ignorant. Admit the problem. For those who came in late, the first video that I want you to watch with section one is Letitia Thomas, and she has a deep free lifestyle success moment. The second video I want you to watch is to is deep free to be free episode number one. Now I, I hasten to say that in the workbook, in the workbook we have actually more than uh, just uh, uh, questions and answers. I had a woman stop me the other day, and she uh, she said to me, "Now, Reverend, uh, I need the answers to the questions in the workbook." And I said to her, "The answers are in you. It's not that kind of workbook where where you have multiple choice questions. This is not a financial literacy program. This is a behavioral impact ministry. It's a financial empowerment movement. So so don't think the workbook." has multiple choice questions A, B, C, and D, and if you get 90% right, you get an A, and if you get 60% right, you flunk. It's not that kind of workbook. It's a workbook to help us work through the various questions and issues that we have to work through in order to achieve financial freedom. So it's not as if you read the book and then the workbook asks you questions to see if you remember what you read in the book. No, the workbook actually has additional stories to the book. It has exercises. It has questions like those that we've discussed already. And the workbook all, also has a fictitious family. We, we discovered through the years that it can be painful. It can be very painful to really look at ourselves and begin to discussing our finances in the presence of other people. In fact, it can be painful to discuss our finances in the presence of one person. And so what we did for the workbook was to create a fictitious family, Claude and Grace. Claude and Grace have children, they have stepchildren, they have a dynamic family, a family that addresses all of the issues that we address. And Claude and Grace, in each chapter of the workbook, have challenges and issues that relate to the subject of that chapter in the workbook. And so during episode one of the video series and chapter one in the workbook and, and in the text, uh, Claude and Grace have a chapter one type experience. And what we discovered was that it's sometimes easier to help other people solve their problems. In fact, that's why some of us are in the shape that we're now, because we spent so much time helping other people caring for other people, sometimes lending money to other people, sometimes giving money to other people. We spend so much time focusing on other people. We really haven't had adequate time and attention and resources for ourselves. So we've created this family, Claude and Grace, and Claude and Grace start out each chapter. And tonight in episode, in, in chapter number one, you'll see Claude and Grace facing some very basic issues like the ones we're discussing. And in the workbook, you're asked to help Claude and Grace solve their problem, or at the very least, address their problem. And then, after Claude and Grace get access to your advice, we ask you to compare the advice you would give yourself to the advice that you just gave, gave Claude and Grace. So I'm going to leave Claude and Grace out of our monthly webinars, and I'm going to let you deal with Claude and Grace on your own. And by next month, I think you'll have an opportunity to chat with me or send me email or contact me to talk about your relationship with yourself and how you benefited from first starting with giving 
Claude and Grace advice. So tonight, if you have a workbook, uh, save Claude and Grace for the work that you're going to do after our webinar. If you get the workbook after tonight, start with Claude and Grace. Don't start with yourself. Tonight I'm giving you highlights, those things that you probably, if you don't hear them from me, you just won't hear them from anybody. And then there'll be additional facts and stories and information in the workbook, in the textbook, and on the videos on our YouTube page. So I wanted to mention Claude and Grace because Claude and Grace are not going to be discussed in our sessions. So let, let's, let's look at this question. Let's look at this question that's next for us. Uh, what, what's wrong with debt? I mean, just, just think about that. What is wrong with debt? Let, let's put that up. I want you to see it graphically. What, what is just, what is actually wrong with debt? And I, I'm, not, I'm generally not one that, that tries to make people feel guilty. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in, in, in telling people how to live, telling people what to do. I, I believe that God gave us freedom of choice, and therefore we have freedom of choice, and it's nobody's right to rob anybody else of the choices that they make. But I do, I do think it's the responsibility of parents, of, of pastors, and other leaders to give people, especially young people, a sense of the consequences of their choices. We, we all have the right to choose anything we, we, we choose. But what are the consequences of the choices that we make? And I, and I, would, I would urge you to take seriously this, uh, this, this question, what is wrong with debt? But what, what's actually wrong with debt? Well, I know the Bible says that, that the borrower is slave to the lender. But on a concrete level, uh, what, what is wrong with debt? And let's start out with what debt is. I mean, debt, debt is an amount that's owed for a service or an item uh, to somebody else. In other words, debt is what I owe you. Debt is not what, what, what I own. Debt is what I owe. And if what I owe exceeds what I earn, then I'm broke. Then I'm broke. Many people assume that the solution to all financial problems is having more money. That, that's what many people assume. They assume that, 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 that having more money is the solution to all financial problems. Well, if that were true, how do you explain the National Basketball Association? In the, in the National Basketball Association, uh, three out of five players file for bankruptcy within three years of retirement. The minimum wage in the National Basketball Association is $375,000. Can you live off $375,000? I mean, I could live off of $375,000, I think. $375,000 comes to about $7,000 uh, $7, a month, a week. $7,000 a week. $350,000 salary. Thousand dollars salary, seven thousand dollars a week, and I'm telling you that in the National Basketball Association, three out of five players who earn at least three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars a year are bankrupt. I'm not telling you they're 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 living uh, on a tight budget. I'm telling you that they hire a lawyer and they go to court and they file formal papers for bankruptcy which means that they can't pay their bills, bankrupt. So it doesn't matter what um, lifestyle of the rich and famous may say on TV or, or MTV Cribs or whatever the shows are now that popularize these big mansions. The fact is if you make $375,000 a year and you spend $376,000 a year, you're broke. One player made $200 million a year, and he's broke, which means that having more money should not be the first effort that we make. Having more money shouldn't be the most important thing on our minds. The most important thing on our minds is really identifying what we are doing with our money and how we can change what we do with our money to begin paying off debt. Getting out of debt is the first step towards developing wealth. 
getting out of debt is the first step towards breaking the stronghold of financial bondage. Getting out of debt is as important for those who want long-term financial strength as getting off the plantation was for black people in the South during slavery. Getting out of debt. So D3 is not only about debt. We're going to talk about insurance. We're going to talk about real estate. We're going to talk about expanding our income. We're going to talk about helping others. We're going, to, we're going to talk about any number of things. We're going to talk about saving money for our children's college education the day after they're born. But none of that makes sense if we're drowning in debt. What difference does it make if you're saving money in a bank and getting 1% interest while paying money to a credit card company that charges you 18% interest? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to invest in a stock. Mark gives you an 8% and the credit card companies charge you 24% interest. What difference does it make? It does not make sense to own a house that appreciates in value 5% every year. And you're paying a car loan that costs you 29% per year. It does not make sense. And so whether the debt is a car loan, a student loan, whether the debt is is a, a credit card loan or a mortgage. I mean, the only kind of debt that is reasonably positive is the debt that somebody else pays. We'll, we'll talk about that later on when we talk about real estate. But every, every place I go, people want to know about good debt and bad debt as if, as if owning a house and paying a mortgage is good debt. It's better debt than a credit card debt. But the fact is, the only true debt that's good debt is debt that someone else pays for you. And so if I own an apartment building and my apartment building has a mortgage and the tenants pay me the rent and their rent money covers my mortgage, that's good debt. That's good debt. In fact, that's great debt. But the quicker I get rid of that debt, the sooner the tenant's money goes in my pocket. So it's not great debt in the sense that uh, I'm holding on to it for the rest of my life. So we start this road to financial freedom by focusing on debt. And, for, and, and, and what I had to do, by the way, I had to write down every penny that I spent. I'm urging you to do the same thing. And find out what money that I already have that I could use to pick up the pace, speed things along to pay off my debts. So I have, a, I have a slide here. I have a page in the workbook that actually gives you a list of things that you could consider. Uh, it's page 13 in the workbook. And let's see if I can get it. I don't seem to do a very good job with this uh, sharing. I don't seem to be doing a good job sharing these pages. In fact, I don't even know where the pages went. But uh, the assignments are lottery tickets, car loans, family and friends, student loans. Uh, these are barriers that we have to finding money that we can use to get out of debt. I'd like everybody to uh, identify some of these barriers. It would help if I could find out where the... Uh, it, where the workbook is so that I can hold on one second uh, so that I can share it with you but if I can't share it with you I'm just going to ask you to write these down and if you write these down then you can decide which ones are your barriers uh, are you spending money on lottery tickets yes or no you answer the question I don't need to uh, see the answer in Texas, African Americans spend over a billion dollars a year on lottery tickets. And 58% of African Americans in Texas are described by the University of Texas as spending $57 a month on lottery tickets. What do you think my message to the people in Texas might be? $57 every month invested in lottery tickets. 
$57 every single month invested in lottery tickets. Car loans. We had who was paying a high interest on a car loan because what we, we, we discovered that people would pay high And payment was low enough. It will pay 99% interest if the payments are $100 a month, you know, for 22 years. So what is the interest rate on your car loan, and could you reduce the amount of money that you spend on your car payment every month if you were able to lower the interest rate on your car loan? To a company that says, listen, I'm paying this much money for my car every month. Uh, can you give me a better rate? They gave him a better rate, and he saved $400 a month. He was driving the exact same car, but what happened was he actually ended up saving $400 a month on his payments. That's $4,800 a year. In 10 years, that's only to send a student to Rutgers University for two years, just on a car loan. Family and friends, are you giving money to family members and friends knowing they'll never pay you back and it's eating away at your financial strength. This is particularly uh, urgent for senior citizens and grandparents who just can't tell their grandchildren no and their grandchildren are wasting their money and spending Nana's money on things they need. Student loans. People ask me how, how do I pay off student loans and the answer is as quickly as you can. Student loans can't be discharged in in uh, bankruptcy. In other words, if, if I have a student loan and I start making the payments, the student loan people will find me. They'll come to my job. They'll find me at home. If I die, they'll come to the funeral, sit with the family, go to the cemetery, and then go downstairs at the church and have chicken. Student loans, you can't get rid of student loans. The only way to get rid of a student loan is to pay it off, and the only way to pay it off is quickly. If, if you have a student loan, you shouldn't chew gum, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, you shouldn't get your nails done, you don't need new shoes until your shoes fall apart. Every penny that you can scrape together for something that you don't need, you go from what you don't need to paying off that student loan. The longer it takes you to pay off the student loan, the longer you'll be a slave. Credit cards, you know about credit cards. Payday loans, we'll talk about payday loans. I don't care what Montel Williams tells you at 3 o'clock in the morning, payday loan is not only slavery, payday loan is like super slavery. Gambling, gambling. Have you ever seen Donald Trump sit in front of a uh, slot machine? Donald Trump owned four casinos in Atlantic City, and Donald Trump does not play slot machines. Casinos and gambling are a tax on poor people. Rich people don't play slot machines. Rich people are not involved in games of chance for survival. One of the most tragic scenes you ever want to witness is to go to a casino community like Atlantic City or like Las Vegas, mostly Atlantic City, downtown Philadelphia and you see busload after busload after busload of senior citizens living on fixed income who have lost all the money they had and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and the bus doesn't come till six and they're sitting there broke busted and disgusted so which of these speaks to your reality which, which which of these speaks to who you are? Which of these circumstances have you experienced? Because it will be one, two, or three of these realities that you will identify, you'll look in the mirror of your life, and you'll decide, if I'm going to change, I've got to start with that. And then you'll get started. Think about it. I'll give you a second to think about it. Lottery tickets, car loans. Family and friends, student loans, mm -hmm. credit cards, payday loans. Okay, while I've got the notes up in the workbook, that's page 13 in the workbook. 
I'm sorry, that 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 is not page thirteen. It looks like page thirteen. But here's here's uh here's page that is page thirteen. Okay. We gotta hasten. I didn't want to hold you more than an hour. Here, here's where we go. As we build this foundation tonight, what we what we have to do is we have to uh, begin making some commitments. If you don't have a bank account, if you don't have a bank account, if 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 you are one of the 54% of African Americans that don't have bank accounts, I want you to commit to opening a bank account or a college savings account. Within the next 30 days, between now and the time we meet again like this, I want to know that you've opened one account that you don't have. If you have a savings account, open a checking account. If you have a checking account, open a retirement account. <clears throat> My sons are 25 years old, and I've sat with them to help them begin the process of opening a retirement account. 25 years old, you put $100 a month away for the next 40 years of your career. And at 65, forget your 401k, forget Social Security. At 65, you'll at least have enough money in an account to reasonably begin thinking about retirement. Now, you're not going to be a multimillionaire unless you put $300 a month aside. And the earlier you start, the more successful you're going to be. So, so tonight, uh, as in each chapter in the workbook, we ask you to make a commitment. Commit to doing something you've never done to ensure that you'll have something that you've never had. And the first commitment is the one that speaks to some account. 33%, 33% of, of African Americans have bank accounts but don't use them. 21% don't have any account anywhere. And when you, don't have a, when you don't have a bank account, when you're not dealing with transactions through legitimate institutions, you're checking your cash at a check cashing joint and you're paying high fees. You're borrowing money from pawn, from pawn shops and you're paying high fees. You're borrowing money from payday lenders <clears throat> and you're paying high fees. The, the minimum uh, equivalent interest rate on a payday loan is 390 percent interest, 390 percent interest. That's the equivalent interest rate on a payday loan all over America. In Ohio, if you live in Ohio, you're paying seven to 800 percent interest to borrow hundred dollars to thousand dollars and the interest rates are published right there on the website of the company. So, so, so make up your mind. In 2015, you're going to open an account, just one account, that you don't currently have. You can open up a college savings account for your child at one day old. Get them a social security number, open that account, and start putting money into that account with the advice of a professional licensed financial advisor. I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an investment counselor. I'm just a preacher encouraging people first to do what I did, and that is to work your way out of your financial bind. And secondly, my job was to encourage you to find a professional, a professional insurance person, a professional investment person. Find a professional accountant. Find yourself a professional who's licensed, who can show you their license. They've passed the test. They work for legitimate firms, and they will give you free advice the first time you see them. I'm not recommending who you go to, but go to somebody. So that's commitment number one. Commitment number two is to list the challenges. What challenges have you had relative to finances? You know what my challenge was? My challenge was I thought I should look real good. When I became a preacher, I thought I should drive a preacher's car. I was driving a Chevrolet when I started preaching, and as soon as I became a minister, I bought a Cadillac. And I bought a Cadillac because I thought preachers drove Cadillacs, and preachers did buy Cadillacs, uh, buy Cadillacs and drive them, but they could afford them. I couldn't afford a Cadillac, 
but I want to look like a Cadillac. I want to look like a preacher. I wanted nice things. I wanted nice restaurants. My first challenge was that I could not control my spending. For others, the challenge to um, balance their checkbook. I was guilty of that. I think I was guilty of everything. I wouldn't balance my checkbook. I just write checks and hope they didn't bounce. Another challenge I had was was that I would I would lend people money. Here I was broke, but I was a big shot. And so you may want to put down if you're like me, uh, big shot. Maybe that's a challenge. But whatever your challenge, list three to five challenges that you have. Now this is not to turn in. This is not to mail out. This is not to confess publicly. What I'm telling you is this: you have the ability to speak to yourself. We'll talk about the product of sun next week. But speak to yourself. Tell yourself what your challenges are. One challenge may simply be you just don't make enough money. I don't want to go there first, though, because that's, that's an easy way out. It's easy to say I don't have enough money. Let's figure out what's happening with the money that we have now. That's, a, that's commitment number two. That's an assignment of sorts tonight. Then number three, what, what are those goals? What, what, are, what are those goals that, that I asked you to write down earlier? But, but here's number four. What are you proud of? I mean, what have you done well? This is page, uh, th th this, is, uh, this can't be page 13 because, well, it may be on page 13. It, we're still on page 13. If you have the workbook, if you have the workbook, uh, you know, make, make sure you look at page 13. That's a great page. Uh, what are you proud of? What have you done well? Did you negotiate the price of something that you paid and were successful at paying less than the sticker price? Write that down. Were, 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 you, were you disciplined enough to avoid spending money on something you didn't need? Write that down. Were you committed to uh, paying as you go? Write it down. Every one of us has some strengths and some weaknesses, some good and some bad, some successes and some failures. And so I'm assuming that you've come to this relationship, you've come to this gathering, you've come to this webinar with some good things that you've done. Have you started writing a book? Write that down. H have you been going on job interviews regularly to increase your income? Write that down. Write down three, four, five. If it's 12, write down all of the things that you're proud of relative to your finances. Have you kept all of your bills organized in one place? Have you kept track of your interest rates? Anything you've done that you're proud of. If, if you and I were to talk one-on-one, -on -one, you say, look, sorry, I may not have it all together, but, but I've got this. Are you out of debt but just don't know what the next step is? Write that down. Do you have enough insurance to cover your needs and your family's needs if you were to die tonight? Write that down. Write that down. That's, that's the assignment. And then finally, uh, will you invite somebody to come on this journey with you? I'm not just talking about these webinars, although I am. I am talking about these webinars. These webinars will give us a chance to talk directly. Once we get our little chat room set up, you'll have a chance to be interactive and ask, ask questions. But, but you know somebody who needs to read the book, use the workbook, and take control of their finances. We're just getting started tonight. And what I want you to do is to commit yourself to contacting one person and say, you know what, I'm, I'm committed to this thing called D3. Explain what D3 is. And then what I want you to do is to invite them. Give yourself a date. Write down what day, February the 1st, February the 13th, what day you're going to invite your coworker, your cousin, your friend. And what about that person that owes you $25 and can't seem to remember? Invite them. And I promise you by the end of the year, uh, we will either get you your money back or they'll no longer be your friend. Listen, it's 9 o'clock. God bless you. Uh, we've gone through the highlights of the workbook. Uh, D3 is a textbook and a workbook. And I'm going to pray this closing prayer for you and with you and pray that God will direct us throughout this year so that by Christmas of this year we'll have testimonies that we've never heard before.
about financial freedom. Thank you, God, for the victory that we have experienced already. You're an awesome God, and we commit this journey to you. We believe that we can do this because we will depend on your power to help us. Amen. God bless you.